Hey, Bill, I want to ask you, this is a question that we, you know, some people in the, in, in the community that I kind of participated in kind of kicked around. It's like, you know, harnessing fire uh, would have required some level of intelligence. So did we have to have, you know, just that initial bump of maybe scavenging animals, you know, that caloric bump, that nutrient bump, drive enough brain growth to where we can now, you know, kind of say, hey, we can, we're smart enough to, to figure out this fire thing, you know, because it's kind of, you kind of wonder, because it probably took some a level of intelligence to, to, to be able to, to harness fire. Do you see any evidence that that's true? That's a great question. So, you know, I'm sure that played a role in it. So the, the, the influx of incredible calories and great nutrition from scavenging animals certainly played a role in a lot of different things, right? It probably freed up a little time that we would have normally spent gathering insects or gathering plants. Um, it probably gave us a boost in a lot of ways to start thinking outside of the box. And I'm sure in some ways led to, led to the uh, control and, and harnessing of fire. Um, I do believe it's also one of these things where, you know, this long relationship, you know, this is the model that's usually put out there, you know, millions of years ago, you know, three, four, five million years ago, you know, we might have, our ancestors might have seen, started to see the benefits of fire. You know, lightning strikes, something's burning, you run, and all of a sudden a fire has swept through a grassland, killed animals, insects that were in there, and all of a sudden you're smelling cooked meat, you're seeing a whole bunch of, because there are a lot of insects that are, um, uh, I forget the word, that are, but are, they're drawn to fire, right? And, and they'll die in a fire as well. So you have all these insects, which were definitely in our diets at the time, cooked meat, which has an aroma that you know that we're just drawn to anyhow. And slowly over time, we started to see that there was this, this, this thing in nature that was giving us food and food that we really enjoyed and food that really helped us feel really good. And over a lot of time, we got closer and closer and closer. And then maybe we started finding that if we, you know, it would die out when it didn't have any more grass or wood to burn. And we knew we could put some on there and keep it going and then eventually figured out how to do it. But the other, um, the other thing that I think is, is, um, is really important to think about is, Food, I did a television program in Ireland a couple of years ago, and the host asked me this question, and it got me thinking about it. He says, so did eating better food increase our brain size or eating more calories increase our brain size? Like, and, I'm, and I said, well, yes. And then he said, well, what if we fed a whole bunch of, you know, this food to a chimpanzee? What would you get? And I said, you get a fat chimpanzee. Like, I think there's two things to think about. And, and it, we, our, our diet and our dietary change and our ability to access incredible nutrients supported our body and brain growth. But there was something else going on that initiated it or fuel or, 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 or pushed it to happen. I mean, there's all kinds of thoughts. I mean, some people believe it's hallucinogenic drugs that got us thinking outside of the box. Some people believe that, you know, as we increase, one of the most brain taxing activities for humans is creating and maintaining social relationships. So, you know, maybe it was an indirect thing. As we had access to more food and our group sizes uh, got bigger, you know, we had to, to push and push and push our brains and use more of them to create and maintain more social relationships and keep the group going. And, do, and that actually pushed our brains to get bigger as our diets were supporting this growth. So I think there's two things happening at the same time, both probably in some way food, you know, related, but they're two, I think they're two, we have to think along both of those lines at the same time. Bill, do we know, like, along the lines of fire, do we know when, when humans were, went from, like, just taking advantage of, like, a naturally forming fire versus learning how to kind of create it on their own? No, because we're still, we are still arguing about when we even had fire. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and again, a lot, of, a lot of archaeologists will say, we only have direct evidence for this at this point, so it must not have happened beforehand, or we're not even going to suggest it did beforehand until. And I think a lot of the archaeologists who also have their hands in, in doing, in, in, you know, in making fire and, 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 and hunting and doing these sorts of things, realize that none of these things are overnight. There's a long, long lead up to be able to do it. So Francis Burton uh, wrote an incredible book where she's talking about the role of fire in the past. And she's the one that lays out this timeline that says, 
you know, she, I, I forget the exact dates, but something like five or six million years ago, we started getting closer to fire, formed a relationship for millions of years, and probably around two million years had control of it. 